All right, chapter 16, the planning. During the spring of 1796, Ona Judge's mind would have been filled with dreams, nightmares, plans, and challenges. Every night as she brushed Martha Washington's hair before bedtime, she would have to be careful not to tug too hard on the aging woman's scalp, no matter how furious she was that Martha had betrayed her so completely. Each morning as she removed the stains from Martha's dresses and scraped the mud and dirt off of Martha's shoes, she would have to stop herself from angrily ripping the dress and destroying the shoes, forcing herself to calm down and confront her future. What Ona knew for sure was that she would never, ever be Eliza Park Custis Law's slave. Not for one day, not for one hour, not for one second. Now, she would have to figure out an exit plan. In public, Ona held her tongue. Just like Martha pretended to be happy about Eliza's wedding to Thomas Law, Ona pretended to be Martha's obedient slave. In reality, Ona reached out for help. The Underground Railroad did not exist yet. Harriet Tubman had not been born. The escape routes that the enslaved whispered about during the years leading up to the Civil War were still a fantasy. The rooms where slaves hid, the tunnels under the roads, the secret compartments and wagons, those were more than 30 years in the future. In 1796, slaves who planned their escape had fewer options. Many times they trusted the stories they had heard about escape routes, fleeing to the wilderness, hiding in an abandoned cabin, scrambling into a stone cavern. The goal was to get lost in a city or reach a free state where they would be able to have a new identity, hiding from the nosy slave catchers who were poking around looking for the easy reward of turning in a fugitive slave. Ona had the added challenge of wanting to escape from the most important person in the country. More challenges, she was in a city where everyone knew who she was. She did not know how to read or write, and most of all, she was terrified. But her anger helped. Whenever she thought about it, she still could not believe that Martha was going to give her as a gift, like a piece of china, to a woman who everyone knew was impossible. Every time Ona thought about this, it reinforced her decision to leave. She had to make a plan, and she had to carry it out. It was clear to Ona and most of the other slaves in Philadelphia that the life of a fugitive slave was dangerous. Despite the gradual abolition laws in some of the northern states, several hurdle, hurdles stood in the way of men and women who escaped. The most obvious hurdle was weather. Northeastern winters were ice cold, literally freezing one of the main escape routes, the rivers and the creeks. It was hard enough to get a warm coat or shoes when you were enslaved, particularly if you were from one of the southern states. To be on the run in a threadbare coat was asking for hyperthermia or death. Escaping during the spring and summer was not much easier. Fugitives were just as susceptible to heat and humidity as they were to brutal cold. They could die from dehydration, starvation, or heat stroke. Ona's escape deadline would be determined by the date that she would be expected to join Eliza's new team of house slaves near the federal city, where the newlyweds had purchased a home. Presumably, Martha thought Ona should move in with Eliza and Thomas when the rest of the Washingtons packed up to travel back to Mount Vernon for the summer. Ona also faced a familiar and frustrating obstacle, her gender. 90%, 90 as in 90, of fugitive slaves from Pennsylvania to Virginia were male. The reason was pretty simple, children. Marriages between slaves were not recognized by the law, but as always, people fell in love and wanted to remain with their partners and begin families of their own. Throughout the plantation-filled South, many enslaved women fell in love and had children. Many enslaved women were not in love, but still had children. What was true for just about all of them, <coughs> sorry, was that they were responsible for their children. Even if fathers wanted to be involved in their children's lives, they were sometimes working in fields far away from their wives. If and when an enslaved father decided to escape, he would more than likely go it alone. The age range of most fugitives was between 16 and 35. Not coincidentally, 
This was also the exact age span when enslaved women tended to be pregnant, feeding, or caring for a child. Even if a woman with a child had an opportunity to escape, it was often an impossible decision for her to make. If she left her child behind, the child could be whipped. If she took the child with her, she would most likely get caught. An infant's cries of hunger would shatter the necessary silence of a fugitive's flight. A small child would be unable to keep up with adults literally running for their lives. For many of the enslaved women, there was simply no choice. They would remain slaves because their priority was to care for their children, no matter the cost to themselves. Ona had managed to reach the age of 23 without having children. If she escaped, she would likely never see her sisters and brother at Mount Vernon again. This was painful, but it was not the same agony as having to leave behind one's child or else risk that child's safety by taking him or her along on the run. Ona's youth and her childlessness would aid her in escape. What would stop her in her tracks was the overwhelming fear of what could happen if she were caught, captured, and returned to the Washingtons. And she was right to be afraid. Okay, I'm on page 142. I'm going to be pausing.